Hello, and welcome back to the Carbon Capture Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Danielle Pikarski, and I am joined today by Manoj Valuri, Project Manager at Advanced Resources International. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Danielle. Of course. Manoj will be presenting at the National Carbon Capture Conference being held November 7th and 8th in Des Moines, Iowa. He will present on a panel titled Reviewing the Unique Aspects of Carbon Capture and Storage Project Development, which will take place at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, November 7th. Manoj, you will be talking about the factors impacting CCS project development. Can you tell us some of the specifics of what you'll focus on during your presentation? Absolutely. So one of the things that I wish to cover in my talk relates to what goes into developing a successful CCS project. And this includes, you know, various phases of the project as it start, as it goes from inception through injection of CO2 and recovering some of those tax credits. At, through my experience at ARI, I have been lucky to work with um, regulators all across the country and understand how their specific requirements and demands have shaped the development of these projects. That is one of the perspectives that I plan to bring to this panel and to the talk by explaining a little bit more about how some of these regulation, regulations can shape the feasibility of these carbon storage projects and additionally profitability of these projects as well. All right. So what criteria makes a site suitable for high potential CO2 storage? And how do these criteria affect the success of a CCS project? Yeah, thank you. There's two different buckets of factors that we look at. The first one is the subsurface related factors such as the geology. Typically when you know someone comes to us with a request or interest in looking at CCS at their project site, you know, be it an ethanol plant or a utility, we start by looking at, okay, do they have sufficient geology right where they're located? And by that, I mean, to put away CO2, you need to have a good reservoir or rock that can take in all the carbon dioxide that you'd like to put away and store. And on top of the reservoir, you need to have an extremely competent seal or a confining layer and this is like a slate that essentially traps all the carbon dioxide or all the gas that you're putting in this reservoir so we try to look for a multitude of factors a multitude of geologic factors such as you know how deep are these reservoirs and confining layers or seals how porous and how permeable are these are there any faults or any other geologic features that can compromise the storage project and things of that nature now, stepping back to the surface or, you know, taking a bird's eye view of things, you know, there's also factors not, that are not related to geology that also help determine how suitable a site is for a CO2 storage project. And this includes factors such as land usage, for instance, you know, there are wetlands in Louisiana that may not be amenable to a CO2 storage project compared to, you know, an agrarian land or pastures in the Midwest. So it's it's those type of land considerations that can also make or break a project because you know eventually all of those also flow into you know what type of permitting is involved in developing these projects and sometimes the permitting and the regulatory elements related to these projects can you know make or break the profitability or even the deployability of these projects. Additionally, there's other factors such as land ownership and surface and land rights and even overall public sentiment, be it the opposition or the momentum that the local public can bring to some of these projects. Hopefully that helped answer the question. Yes, thank you. So there are some concerns out there in the public. So could you go over what some of the key risks are associated with developing CCS projects in the U.S. and how we can manage and minimize those risks? Absolutely. 
again, just like we look at criteria from a surface standpoint and a subsurface standpoint, the risks of these projects can also be parsed into the surface risks and the subsurface risks. From a subsurface perspective, you know, the major risks are, you know, what happens if the CO2 that you're injecting starts leaking? You know, what if it reaches the freshwater zones or even worse, what if it reaches the atmosphere and starts affecting the area around the sequestration site? And typically how we address that is by, again, going back to the drawing board and looking at how competent the reservoirs are and how competent the confining or the overland seal rocks are in trapping the CO2. And on top of that, the whole plastics process, for those of you that don't know, plastics process or underground injection control plastics well program is what regulates these carbon storage projects and CO2 injection wells. And that regulatory process has been robustly designed to minimize any such leakage pathways and help mitigate any unforeseen situations that may or may not arise in a carbon storage project. One best example is when you're developing your CO2 project, you have to make sure you are injecting well below a freshwater zone or what EPA calls an underground source for drinking water. And this is zone designated by 10,000 parts per million cutoff in the salinity of the water. So typically the portable water or drinking water zones that we tap from are about 3,000 parts per million or less. So you can see how the EPA or this program is adding an extra level of safeguard by saying anything about 10,000 parts per million is fair game, but anything below that is not. So that's one such you know, mitigation step that EPA and project developers and owners take in developing these projects to minimize those subsurface risks. And there's many other risks and mitigation procedures you know, that we have to assess as we develop these projects. And from a surface standpoint, again, like I said, uh, like in, in my previous response, you know, surface factors such as land use, land rights, land ownership, these are some of the major risks that we are observing in the projects we are working on today. If a project owner does not have a good relationship, that could be a factor that could make or break a project. So one way to get ahead of that and mitigate that is outreach. Transparent, periodic, and frequent outreach to get in front of the landowners, get in front of the stakeholders, and explain what your project is, and also explain what benefits, and conversely, what risks are associated with developing this project in order to get their support and get their buy-in. And that also makes the regulatory process easier, because eventually uh, these wells will have to be permitted, like I said, through the classics program, and all the permits have a public comment period. So it's important for the project owners to get ahead of that process and reach out to the local population and let them know of what's coming. So the locals are not finding out about projects in their backyard for the first time through the regulators. And one of the overarching, just looking at the process, even before you go to injection, before you go to the public, you have to put in the permit application to the, the local office of the EPA and the timeline associated with putting in that permit and getting it reviewed and getting a permit to construct these wells is one of the biggest holdup in the process right now. And one way you can address that risk is by developing a timely and a quality and a robust application to put in front of the regulators that also minimizes that back and forth. Well, thank you again. So I would want to pivot a little bit back to tax credits. How do captures qualify for that federal tax credit for CCS projects? And what impact do the incentives have on project development? Yeah. So federal tax credits have been around since 1986, and they are administered under the section under Section 45Q of the Internal Revenue Code. It started out as a $20 per metric ton in 2008, and today, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, we're at $85 per metric ton of CO2 that's sequestered. And how carbon captures qualify is that any entity that establishes a carbon capture mechanism that captures, these, captures carbon dioxide that's otherwise emitted into the air 
can avail up to $85 per metric ton, provided they are storing it permanently in the ground. And there's other crediting mechanisms such as voluntary credits, but federal credits are the most evolved to date. And these credits, especially at the new $85 per metric ton levels, have been a huge economic driver for a lot of the projects, especially in the ethanol space. Because if you do the math with ethanol, you know, capture probably takes up to twenty to thirty dollars per metric ton and you add another twenty to thirty dollars for storage, you are looking at approximately twenty to twenty five dollars per metric ton in a surplus in tax credits that your project can avail, right? So and obviously, you know, as the volumes go up, costs go down and there's also the economies of scale. So if you're an ethanol plant, if you have you know a decent tax burden and if you're able to pull off a carbon storage capture and storage project, there's a huge financial incentive, especially with the IRAs, 45Q reforms. All right. Well, we are coming near the end of our time here, but I do still have one last question for you. And I'm curious what some topics are that you look forward to hearing about or hope to learn more about at the National Carbon Capture Show this year. Absolutely. Um, I personally am interested in learning more about what challenges some other projects are facing with in our country when it relates to de- deployment, be it regulatory hurdles, financial hurdles. And, you know, I'd like to understand more about how us, you know, consultants and project developers can help these projects, you know, help get off the ground. We'd like to hear more. And I personally would like to hear more from the ethanol industry themselves and what they see as what the hurdles are to the process. Is it the regulators? Is it the geology? Is it pipelines? Yeah, that's that's something I'd like to get a more handle off and, you know, again, help improve our offerings. For sure. Well, I'm sure that we'll have all of those covered at the show this November. Again, today we are joined by Manoj Valuri, Project Manager at Advanced Resources International. Manoj, thank you again for joining us on the podcast today, and I look forward to meeting you in Des Moines this November. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. And thank you to our listeners. If you would like to learn more about CCS project development, join us on Tuesday, November 7th at 1 p.m. for Minoj's panel, reviewing the unique aspects of carbon capture and storage project development in Des Moines, Iowa at the National Carbon Capture Conference and Expo. Until next time.